Are there ways that we can hone the ideas we have to make them better than ever? That's what we'll talk about today. A library is a delivery room for the birth of ideas. A place where history comes to life. Norman Cousins. And I like to think of that as books, the internet, all the different places we have to gather ideas, thoughts, history, and see what ideas worked or maybe didn't work so well. We have the birthplace of ideas at our fingertips almost at all times. We're going to continue our conversation about the book, How to Get Ideas by Jack Foster. We're having a little bit of an ideas problem solving mini series right now. The first one I did talked a little bit about how I try to do some problem solving and think about things in a new framework, a new light. Now we're trying to figure out how can we gain ideas? If we're stuck in a problem, can we think about things a little bit differently, look at things in a different way? And that way, when we solve problems, we have a wealth of ideas to pick from about what we can do to make things better. So the question is, what can we do? Not just to think about one idea or think of one way of solving the problem, but the more ideas we generate, the more things that we can think of to bring together the tools we have to fix any problem, make some new accomplishment, the better off we'll be and the bigger likelihood this new thing will get implemented, will cure something of our own ill, of our family's ill, of societal's ills, <laughs> whatever we're trying to solve. But that way, we want to generate a bunch of ideas. And how we ended this podcast last time was talking about rumination, thinking about ideas, letting your brain churn away at them, and what to do if you're just finding out you're not very good at getting ideas. How can you get out of that rut, which was doing creative things, doing something new? The more new things you do, the more you will be a generation box of ideas. I find even when it comes to work travel, I used to travel quite a bit for work. Strangely enough, a lot of my ideas brought themselves forth when I was traveling. And maybe it's because I got out of my house, away from my situation. I was sleeping in a different bed. I was walking around a different community. I was meeting new people. I was looking at a different landscape. Like I said, I used to sit at the La Brea tar pits and just look at the world around me. Whatever reason, that was a great problem-solving method for me, just being someplace new. And so I think that's what he's talking about, is to get out of ruts so that we think and generate a lot of ideas. Because the more ideas we generate, the more we'll be able to pick from in order to solve or move forward or do whatever we're trying to do. He said that there's a lot of bad ideas out there in history that turned out to be great ideas. Madame Curie, he said, had, quote, a bad idea that turned out to be radium. Alexander Graham Bell was to trying to build a hearing aid. He got the telephone instead. I think 3M post-it notes were supposed to be some super glue that 3M was trying to create. And you know what? Post-it notes are the least super gluey thing I have because I can stick them to something and peel them off and stick them to something else. So it looks like an outright failure. It looks like not solving the problem we were trying to solve. But instead, there are no bad ideas. It may be bad for that situation you were trying to look at, but it's probably great for something else. Instead, maybe you've built something really incredible. He says it's a good idea to come up with lots of ideas. Instead of being, oh, that's that person who has a bunch of terrible ideas, you'll be known as that person always who has a great idea, who always thinks of things outside the box. You want to be known as that second thing. And even if Many of your ideas don't work out, maybe in the work world. It's not practical. You'll become that person that says, hey, you know what? We got this tough problem to solve. You know who thinks of ideas? Oh, that person. They think of ideas all the time. And they come to that person because they know you're going to be the person who thinks outside the box. And you know how I know that? Because I tend to be that person. When someone gets stuck, a lot of people come to me, whether I'm in the work world or not, and ask me for, how can I get out of this situation? Or how can I think about something different? Or what can I do to make this work? I always admired 
where Apollo 13, the people that almost died in space because their capsule broke and they weren't able to return. And they ended up using cardboard, some tape and a paperclip or something. And they did this fix in space so that they could get back home. That kind of thinking has always appealed to me. And that's what he's hoping for you in this book, that you can be that person who's an ideas person. You know who you should go to to solve your problem? Go to that person, always thinking of new ideas. He says at times, too, you go to other people, get some other people involved in your project. But part of the difference is that you have to worry that sometimes he says that too many people spoil the group. If there are people who are not ideas people, that they're not helpful, if they will tell you, oh, you know what? You should just give up now. This idea is unsolvable. If they're going to be the kind of people who bring you down, or maybe sometimes it's just too many people involved in a process, you'll have to remember that sometimes having people might not make it better, that it might not solve the problem. So you want to make sure that you get the right number of people in there to help you. The people you know are also ideas people with you so that you can think of things. So when you surround yourself with people who are great thinkers, it helps you in becoming a great thinker yourself and thinking of unusual ways of solving your problem. He says that you should think laterally, and he said that that's a concept that was popularized by Edward de Bono. And in lateral thinking, he says, you make jumps. You don't follow down this logical path. I tend to be the thinker who is like, if A happens, then we have to solve B. And then if B happens, we have to solve C. I tend to be a very linear thinker. It's like, or in lateral thinking, it's a way of thinking of things outside the box. Maybe even thinking about things with the end conclusion and working your way back. Wikipedia gives the example of lateral thinking is when Solomon had the two women and both were claiming to be the baby's mother. Instead of going down this logical, legal path, of trying to tease out who was actually the mother of the baby, he thought outside the box. That was lateral thinking. It's very hard to explain, but he said that he gives an example of a smaller company and everyone's late. He has a tardiness problem. People aren't showing up. And so instead of getting mad at everyone, yelling at everyone, having a big talk about how we need to show up on time, he said that this person took a Polaroid picture every 15 minutes of the office. And when people saw big holes at their desk, big holes around them, people started realizing they're not coming to work. It was a way without him yelling that he was able to get people to show up at work. Oh, this is really noticeable. I'm not here. (laughs) You know, I think it was more probably embarrassing than anything. But he said that in order to have that lateral thinking, Don't assume boundaries, he says, that aren't there. A lot of times we think that we have this problem, this limitation, it's going to cost this much money, it's going to cost this much time. You don't know. You haven't come up with a solution yet. You have no idea what the time and the money investment really is. So get rid of those deadlines or give yourself fake deadlines. And we talked about that in past podcasts, is either give yourself unlimited, like what would I do if I had all the money in the world? and get rid of limitations, or artificially give yourself new limitations, like, and I have to fix this tomorrow. What would I do if I have to fix this tomorrow? So sometimes that can spur on ideas. And Solomon, with the two mothers, both claiming to be the baby's mother, his boundary was, well, I can't suggest something so horrible that people would be scared by me of even saying the word, which is what he did. He's like, okay, cool. You're both the mothers. Tell you what, we'll just put the baby in half and you get half and you get half. Well, of course, the real mother of that baby is not going to want her baby destroyed. You know, so his limitation of being a sane and wise, you know, calm leader thrown out the door. I'm going to say the most outrageous thing I could possibly say, and that's going to tease out the situation. He says, too, you're trying to look for analogs between things. How does it represent? You know, if you're looking for solving a problem, how are other problems like this solved? Maybe not this problem, but obviously we've had every kind of problem there is in the world. Is there a way of solving this problem like something else? 
So imagine you needed to get your car. You sold your car to someone who's on the West Coast. How do you get there? Think about other ways we get things out to the West Coast. Is it possible I could pay someone to drive my car out there who really wanted to go to the West Coast? And I'm just going to give them all the money for all the gas and hotel to drive my car to California when they wanted to go there anyway. Obviously, transportation has many analogs to what we're doing because people do transportation every day. So think about things that can represent the problem we're having. Then think about, he says, breaking the rules. Vincent van Gogh, he said, broke all the rules in painting. When he painted stuff, didn't look exactly what it was he was painting. But because he broke the rules in a very methodic way, it made his artwork interesting. If I paint a flower and you paint a flower and we both painted the same flower because the flower is a red flower and it looks the same to both of us, boring. But when you break the rules, that's where art becomes art. And it's where our problem solving becomes interesting. He says that you can play the what if game. We talked a little bit about that. And he gives this funny solution from Dr. Robert Van Oak, which was a whack on the side of the head. And remember, two podcasts ago, I talked about the same thing. I'm going to give you a thought adjustment. Sometimes you just need a smack upside the head in order to think about something in a brand new light. When I go about solving a problem, the first thing I try to do is, I, because I'm a methodical person, is I try to think, what exactly is the problem? And sometimes, again, you have to think outside the box when you're doing this, because you may say, well, the problem is they don't make enough money. Is that the problem? Or is the problem that you don't have any opportunities in your company and therefore you'll never get a promotion so that you can make more money? Try to be a little bit looser and not so direct with your problems. Instead, think of outside the box ways that your problem presents itself. Then what I like to do is I like to research, you know, so that's in this book too, he calls about gathering ideas, you know, that you're pulling in all the different thoughts. So if you're looking and saying, well, I have these problems, well, what are the exact problems? I want to work in a place that gives me opportunity to expand my role. So eventually I could make more money and have a bigger role in the company. And I want to have a job that where I can meet friends and I can meet new people. Okay, so you need a job that you have some interactions with other people. Just don't make it, I need a new job. It's boring, it's dull, and it's not going to get you what you want because you really haven't identified the problem. Next, you're going to start looking for ideas, which is the whole point of this book. We're going to start to rumble around different thoughts, different ideas. What can you do? And I mentioned a few weeks ago, I have a roof problem right now where my roof is having a structural problem and I'm kind of stuck between the insurance company and getting people to fix the problem. Part of me is thinking, am I really going about this whole problem in the right way? I mean, of course, I have to solve my roof either way. But maybe I don't want to live in this place anymore. Maybe what I really want is a new house. I want to live somewhere else. Maybe I don't even want a house at all. Maybe I want something where other people take care of the work going on in the house and make sure that the roof is okay and the sinks work all right. The toilet's not running over all night long. Maybe I'm not backing this problem up enough. You're going to start piecing together all these bits of information you have about the problem and gathering details about it, gathering information, collecting all your thoughts so that you can start finding a pathway out. The other thing is you can't procrastinate. It's so easy when we have problems in our lives, when we're having situations, we're just procrastinating on it. And just do it. For goodness sake, solve your problems. I have found in my own life that me worrying about something or thinking about something, even about like my weight, I spent more time thinking and pondering about my weight than I did actually doing anything about my weight. Just do it. Start doing the thing. Because once you start getting yourself out of the problem, it'll become behind you sooner. You'll have those benefits of a good life going on for you. And then put your thoughts into action. Now you have to drop a plan, maybe a very short plan. I don't want you procrastinating with a plan. But what is the next step? My next step is I have to call someone. So I did that too with my roof. You know, I got four different quotes. 
I asked the quote people if they could call the insurance and find out exactly, you know, what it is they're going to pay for and started solving my problem. This last idea he gives in the book is kind of interesting. I'm going to burn the boats. And you know why? Not so that the enemy doesn't get the boat, you know, so we don't have to put people back in order to guard the boat. It's because so people knew that there was no way back other than to win this war. When I lost weight, I tossed out my clothes. I'm not going back. I'm not going to have this dash of clothes that if I put on an extra pound, an extra 10 pounds, going to be comfortable because I have all those clothes back again. Burn the boat. Make sure that you keep going forward. And he says in the end, you have to stay with it. A lot of people have ideas, but how many people actually do the thing to get the investment, the work, and the benefit from those great ideas? Once you do that, you really have something. So my challenge to you is think about something that you could burn the boat on. Is there something that you could make a change in your life and by burning the boat, you'll make it harder to go back to the way you used to have it? All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can leave a review in whatever podcast app you're using. It helps other people find the podcast and tell a friend. I hope that we can grow a community someday of people who solve problems together. And remember, our campaign to solve our problems starts with small steps.